So thank you very much for this wonderful invitation to Potsdam. My theme today is how it is that humans first come to acquire knowledge of objects and minds. And what I'd like to do is to introduce you to the idea that we may need a dual process theory of development to answer those questions. And secondly, to argue that there's an important role and a much neglected role for metacognitive feelings to play in explaining the developmental acquisition of knowledge. So let me start with an old but rather uh, excellent and well replicated study due to Spelke and colleagues. So here you see infants are habituated to a scene in which a ball rolls along behind a screen uh, and while it's behind the screen it keeps rolling it comes to the barrier that you can see at the end there and then the screen comes down with the ball in that position. Very simple. Infants are then, once they've been habituated to that display, shown either a consistent display in which now geometrically this is quite different, the ball's final position and so on is very different, or an inconsistent display which in some ways is geometrically more similar to the first display but in terms of causation it's kind of impossible. What Spelke and colleagues wondered is whether they would get stronger dishabituation to the inconsistent than to the consistent display. And they wondered that because they thought if there is stronger dishabituation to the inconsistent display, that's an indication that the infants are able to understand that objects can't go through solid barriers and are surprised when they appear to do so. Very carefully done study with a nice control condition where the ball is dropped vertically. And what you see if you look at their results is precisely that you get greater dishabituation in the inconsistent case than in the consistent case. What's kind of striking here is that the regain of interest in the inconsistent case is almost like they're back to the beginning. They're finding that super interesting. Beautiful results which as I say have been replicated conceptually many times, a whole variety of different paradigms and apparatus. But there is a well-known puzzle about this kind of findings which is that if you do something rather similar but ask your children to search for the object, in this case by pulling open a door in order to reveal the location of the object, what you find is that two and a half year olds will tend to open a door at random. So the earlier uh, study that I showed you, I'm sorry I forgot to say, these are infants who are just under three months of age, right? So these are very tiny infants, but the two and a half year olds uh, in Hood and colleagues study are unable to open the correct door. And in fact, there's a kind of interesting developmental transition here because three-year-olds will go through a phase of opening a door either side of the barrier. It's like they feel like the barrier's got something to do with it, but they're kind of a random as between which side of the barrier. Whereas your two and a half-year-olds are most likely just to pick, pick a favorite door. However, also Hood and colleagues, if you use the same apparatus but do violation of expectation tasks, so instead of the child having to open the door, the experimenter opens the door and pulls out the uh, rolling ball here, what you find is that the infants at two and a half year old will look longer when the ball is removed from the wrong location. So what we've got here is a beautiful interaction between age and response type. When we do violation of expectations, habituation, anticipatory looking, within limits we tend to get superb performance which is not changing with age. You can test infants as young as you like and generally you get ceiling performance if your methods are good. Whereas if we look at something like a manual search paradigm or a verbal response, what we'll generally find is that there's a rather gradual developmental process with distinct stages to it. So there's an interaction between response type and age. Then you think, well, if you just saw this, you'd think, look, Steve, the natural thing to say about this is just that the uh, habituation, violation of expectations and the rest, they are more sensitive measures. What you're getting here is noisy measures from younger children, giving you the appearance of developmental change, when in fact the more sensitive measure is telling you that there is no change at all. That is why it is absolutely critical that we can create situations when, when you look at those violation of expectation type responses, anticipatory looking and the rest, you get floor-like performance even at the very oldest age, it's also unchanging through development uh, with adults, even adults who've got appropriate scientific training and can tell you full well that these responses are wrong, but you can still generate them. And this is what blocks us from giving the simple and initially attractive answer 
those violation or expectation measures are just more sensitive. If that were true, we would not expect to find that even in adults, we get floor-like performance once we go beyond the limits of the, uh, what the inference can do. Now, importantly, it's not just in the case of objects and their interactions that we get such patterns. We can get similar patterns in studying mind reading, and in particular, false belief. So here's my good collaborator, Jason Lowe, uh, working on a paradigm by Southgate, Senju and colleagues. And in this paradigm, infants are taught, uh, they learn that when these lights go on, Jason is going to reach through one or the other of these holes in order to retrieve a robot from behind these shelters. And infants are able to anticipate where Jason will reach on the basis of where Jason thinks the robot is. What's really critical is when we're just thinking about location, the infants will take into account Jason's false belief about the location of the object in proactively gazing to one or other of these locations. So we have a kind of anticipatory looking test which shows false belief from a very early age. Now, of course, there are, you may know, some uh, issues about replication with some of these uh, paradigms. That isn't going to bother me here in this talk because I think overall if we look at the paradigms as a whole we probably do have sufficient to be confident that this is working. So once again we've got this situation. Famously children until they're about three tend to give systematically wrong answers on false belief trials. Around about the age of three varies a lot from one culture to another, they will start answering individually at random as if they haven't quite made their minds up and then sometime later depending on the individual, lots of individual differences as well as cultural differences here, you'll start to see adult-like performance on false belief tasks when you're asking for a verbal prediction. But if you look at anticipatory looking, you'll see once again this ceiling pattern. And importantly, we can change the task. So if instead of asking about location, we switch to a false belief concerning the numerical identity of an object. So Jason now doesn't have a false belief about where the thing is, but rather whether the robot is this robot or that robot, whether if you like it's Superman or Clark Kent. In that case, what you'll see on these measures is that adults, like infants, all perform at floor if we look at anticipatory looking or violation or expectation measures. Superb. So in the mind reading, and in the object case, and I reckon in many other cases, we have an interaction between the measure and the age. My first question for this talk, first question of two, is why there should be such a thing? Why is there an interaction with age? Now, if you look around in the literature, nearly all of the researchers treat this interaction with age as a kind of quirk that needs to be explained away. And that has led to a number of attempts to offer domain-specific explanations. So in the object uh, cognition literature, there's roughly 20 years of trying to explain the difference between violation of expectations and manual search. And then there's an unconnected discussion, also going back to uh, Clements and Perna's groundbreaking work in 1994, where you're trying to explain away the difference between the violation of expectations or anticipatory looking and the verbal responses in the mind reading case. What people don't generally do is think that these quirks are diagnostic. They're telling us something theoretically important. They generally think of them as methodological uh, disadvantages of the procedures. What they don't generally think is that we need a domain general explanation, an explanation of these quirks that covers all of the different domains. But I think that's what we do need. And I think the tool that we need for this is the dual process theory of development. Now here we have to be very careful because there are some researchers which have saddled our dual process theory of development with some rather heavyweight assumptions. So in their generally very brilliant work, Spelke and Kerry have introduced the notion of core knowledge, which involve commitments about uh, innateness and phylogeny, among many others. Commitments which don't seem essential for solving the problems that we need to solve, and which are hard to test empirically. So what I want to offer in thinking about dual process theory of development is the absolute most stripped down form that it can take, if you will, a lighter version of the dual process theory of development. 
And all it makes, the only claims it makes are these. These are very limited basic claims. The first one is just that there are at least two processes. They don't have to be exactly two, very likely there are more. Now the second claim concerns this distinction due, I believe, to Daniel Kahneman between fast and slow processes. So to say that one process is faster than another just means that it makes fewer demands on scarce cognitive resources like working memory, attention, and inhibitory control. So Kahneman generally talks about fast and slow processes, but of course, if he were being more careful, he would think of these uh, as on a spectrum, it's all relative. So some processes are faster than others. Here's the second claim for our dual process theory of development. One process is faster than another. Excellent. Third claim. The faster processes tend to be relatively unchanging over development. They may change a bit, but essentially culture and learning are not going to make a lot of difference to them. By contrast, slower processes will generally change quite dramatically across development through learning. And what we'll see there are much greater both individual differences and also cultural differences. Now, the last thing we want to say for our dual process theory of development in order to answer that question is that the faster processes will dominate anticipatory looking, whereas the slower processes will dominate verbal responses. And if you think about this, this kind of makes sense because those anticipatory eye movements are generated in milliseconds. They have to operate on a much faster scale, whereas the verbal response, something which itself will take many seconds. And there's really no problem if the verbal response is delayed by a few seconds. And in fact, sometimes researchers in producing tasks have asked their subjects to stop and think before giving a verbal response. It doesn't really cause any problem at all. So this, I take it, faster processes are dominating the anticipatory looking, whereas when we look at the verbal responses, we're mainly seeing the effects of slower processes. That seems like a reasonable assumption. So here's the picture that we end up with. We've got these relatively fast mind reading processes that involve some kind of quite basic but limited model of minds and actions that doesn't change much across development. That's why when we look at the anticipatory looking, we find roughly the same performance at all ages. We've also though got a much slower mind reading process, which starts off with a very simple model that doesn't take into account any kind of beliefs at all, and so it gives you systematically wrong answers, that gradually gets more elaborated as children through a process of cultural learning start to accommodate the notions of desire and then eventually belief. And after that, so on much later, it wasn't, for example, in my case until I was in my 20s, I think, before I understood the notion of schadenfreude. And there are still many kinds of mental state that might be ahead of us in the future that we have yet to come across. But you see how this is supposed to work. You've got your fast process, you've got your slow process. This one's pretty constant over development. It already starts off good, but it doesn't get any better. This one starts off with a kind of disastrous understanding, very limited understanding, perhaps none at all, and gradually, slowly, painstakingly builds up through the process of cultural learning. Combined with the assumption that these two dominate anticipatory looking and verbal responses respectively, we can now explain why there is that interaction with age. We can now explain why there is the interaction with age. It's because what we're looking at when we look at the different responses are, in effect, the operations of the different processes. So far, so good. So what we've done so far is we've said, look, there's a really critical question here, an interaction with age that we see across various different domains. I've looked at objects and minds, but I think you can also look in other domains, actions, geometry, number, and you will see similar patterns. I've suggested that we need a general explanation of why these interactions exist. They shouldn't just be quirks. And I've offered you the dual process theory of cognitive development as a way of trying to explain those quirks. So far, so good. Now, I think this is working well, but if you follow me so far, you come up against a really big problem. And to illustrate, uh, sorry, I should go back here. <coughs> What I really want to do first, actually, is tell you about some predictions. I'll tell you about the predictions, and then I'll tell you about the problem. Uh, so the dual process theory of cognitive development that I've been offering you does generate some predictions. So it, it is testable, and I've been trying to work with some collaborators to test these predictions and to motivate other people to test them as well. So the predictions go like this. Where the infants can track objects or beliefs, 
there should be two distinct processes in adults, and the faster adult process is going to have features in common with the infant process. What that means is that we should be able to look at limits in the adults and find the same limits in the infants. So to illustrate, consider the case where you're tracking briefly occluded objects. So we know that four-month-olds, and in fact much younger infants, so you saw infants just under three in the uh, habituation experiment from Spelke and colleagues right at the start, can do this. They can track briefly occluded objects, objects that move while they're concealed behind a screen. We also know that in adults we can distinguish two object tracking processes using the object-specific preview benefit. And in adults we know that one of those tracking processes is subject to a particular signature limit. So a signature limit here is a case where the process generates an incorrect prediction about the future or about the present, where that prediction is not possibly generated by any of the other models or processes under consideration. So it's kind of an error that can't be based on understanding the truth because it's an error, and it isn't something that you'd expect to be associated with any other process, so it's a signature of this one. This is a signature limit. Now in this case, the object tracking, the key signature limit that we're interested in here concerns featural information. So if you take a solid circle and you move it along and it's briefly occluded by a screen, and then something comes out the other side, which is completely different, so now it's a pattern square, so it's different in shape and texture. As long as the movement trajectory is good, the fast process will treat that as one and the same object. It's treating the, uh, it's treating the solid circle and the textured square as, two complete, uh, as one and the same thing, even though it's obvious that they're two completely different things. So this is a signature limit because, of course, you know and I know that these are not really the same thing. We wouldn't believe that they're the same thing. But that those fast object tracking processes do not take into account that feature information in these circumstances. That's a signature limit of them. And here's the really exciting thing. As Shu, Carey and colleagues have shown, this is also a limit of infants object tracking. So now we've got the same signature limit in the adults and the infants, telling us that we've got the same fast process in the adults and the infants. That is fantastic, and that's exactly the kind of evidence that we want to support the dual process theory. Those are the kind of predictions it makes. And I won't go into them there, but if you look at the online handout for this talk, you'll see some references to other cases where the predictions of the dual process theory have been verified. So what I'm telling you is this. We answer the question, why is there an interaction with age, by making a kind of bold conjecture. We want to say there's always an interaction with age across virtually any domain, and that's always going to be explained across virtually any domain by the dual process theory of cognitive development. Marvellous. But what I've just said as well is that, look, this theory makes some predictions, we can test those predictions, and so far where those predictions have been tested, generally speaking, that's gone pretty well. Now, of course, there are plenty of opponents who, who are going to dispute that, and again, I'll put some references on the handout that's associated with this talk. But now I do come to the problem. There is a problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. If we go back to this rather marvellous habituation study that I started with, what you'll notice, uh, just stand back so you can see the, the sign here, is that the dishabituation effect that we're trying to explain is something that takes place across roughly 40 seconds. And the difference between infants who are shown the consistent test and infants in the inconsistent test group is something like 20 seconds of looking time. Why is that significant? Well, according to the dual process theory of cognitive development, the difference between these two groups is supposed to be explained by faster processes. But the thing about faster processes is that they're supposed to operate in a way that's cognitively efficient to do their work and then stop. So they're not the kind of thing that can explain something that's happening 40 seconds after an event nor the kind of thing that can explain a difference of the order of 20 seconds. All by themselves, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. When we were earlier thinking about it, I specifically referred to anticipatory looking. That's the kind of thing that a fast process plausibly is in the business of doing, making sure that your eyes are moving to where the action 
is likely to be. But nobody has a theory about the nature of fast processes that allows us to predict that they ought to be telling us that you know, you're going to look 20 seconds longer when you see some kind of natural explanation about physical interactions being violated. Nobody has a view about why the fast processes should do that. And in fact, if you think about standard ways of characterizing violation of expectation experiments, what you'll hear people saying is, look, the infant had this expectation, the expectation was violated, so there was some kind of surprise on the part of the infant that caused them to look longer. They needed to check this out. It's very difficult to see how a fast process might be fitting in to anything like that kind of explanation. So with respect to the violation and the habituation of expectations, uh, we get the same thing, by the way, in the false belief case here. It's roughly uh, 10 seconds, for example, in a famous false belief task by Onishi and Baijon. In these cases, we have to explain something by appeal to fast processes for which there just does seem to be no kind of plausible theory that can generate this explanation. So we need to know how fast processes could influence looking duration and pupil dilation. This is my second question for today. How can fast processes influence these things? And we need to, do, we need to explain this in such a way that we can also make it clear why they shouldn't influence verbal responses or manual search. Because for everything that we've said so far, it's just really unclear why it's not the slow processes that are driving violation of expectation and habituation type experiments. So if we go too far, we don't want to end up saying faster processes can influence the verbal responses or manual search, because then we'll undermine our attempt to answer question one. This is my second and last question for today. So here's a way of picturing the question. We think there's an early developing faster process that's relatively automatic. Somehow that influences looking durations, and we want to know how that is. We want to know what gets in there. And likewise, we think there's an early developing automatic process which doesn't actually influence verbal responses or manual search. And we want to be sure that whatever theory we come up with is not going to tell us <laughs> that we're going to get verbal responses as a consequence of the faster processes. The solution, I think, is to appeal to the notion of metacognitive feelings. Before I tell you what a metacognitive feeling is, I want to motivate this by appeal to the expert on metacognitive feelings, Asher Koryat, who says that metacognitive feelings allow a transition from the fast mode, as I would call it, to the slow mode of operation. Metacognitive feelings allow a transition from fast to slow. So, interestingly, Koryat doesn't have a lot to say exactly about how this works. It's more of you about why there would be metacognitive feelings at all. So I share the view with Koryat that metacognitive feelings exist in order to link fast and slow processes, but I want to focus on exactly how that link is made. But before we go any further, I need to say something about what metacognitive feelings are. So to illustrate that, here is a face which I hope will strike many of you here as familiar. Is it familiar? All right, good. So this is a morph of uh, Remo and Frauke and another very famous person who you've probably seen in order to make it slightly less obvious what it is. And the hope here is that I'm going to generate a maximum feeling of familiarity in you. Why do I think that the morph is going to generate that strong feeling of familiarity? Well, feeling of familiarity is driven actually not by how familiar or unfamiliar things actually are, but rather by the fluency of processing. And it turns out that when you morph two familiar faces, you create a face that's even more familiar, but also extremely difficult to identify. So you get the ideal situation to encounter a feeling of familiarity. On the one hand, you can't say who this is, you can't place it. On the other hand, because of that extra fluency, you get kind of very strong feeling of familiarity. So discord between those two situations. And it's this that gives rise to the metacognitive feeling of familiarity. So that feeling of familiarity is my first example of a metacognitive feeling. It's a feeling that arises from processes which monitor cognitive processes, typically for fluency or disfluency. Now, the second important thing about metacognitive feelings generally is nicely illustrated by feelings of familiarity. You can learn to interpret those metacognitive feelings in new ways. 
So much as we have them for faces, you could also have feelings of familiarity for uh, grammatical strings. Right, so if you're given in implicit grammar learning tasks, you're given a series of strings and told that they are or aren't conforming to a rule. And although you can't state the rule, many of those strings will start to feel familiar to you, even ones that you've never seen before, as long as they conform to the rule. Again, an effect of fluency. What Dinesh and colleagues managed to do was to train people to interpret their feelings of familiarity, reinterpret them to rather feelings of grammaticality, and so allowed them to make judgments about whether strings were grammatical or not. So what's important for me is that feelings of familiarity and other metacognitive feelings are not things that tell you by themselves what they are. You have to kind of interpret those feelings and work it back and think, okay, this is familiarity. That involves a piece of learning. Uh, here's my backup face, just in case that one didn't work. So metacognitive feelings, uh, cover a variety of areas. So we've just been thinking about familiarity. There are also feelings of knowing, a feeling that you have that you know something, even if you can't say what it is that you know, um, and a variety of other things. The one that I want to illustrate next is the feeling that someone's eyes are boring into your back, a feeling that you might have if you were being watched. So in Charles Fraser's novel, The Trackers, the lead protagonist, Val, describes a situation where his opponent, Jake, has been walking around him all day. And in the evening, Jake finally confronts the protagonist. And Val reports, Jake said, I wasn't 20 feet back and you never looked around once, never even scratched the back of your neck to show you felt me following there. Val says, I had felt him following all day maybe. I just hadn't known what I was feeling. And this is very important to me. I just hadn't known what I was feeling. There is a metacognitive feeling of being followed, someone's eyes boring into you, being watched. But people who are not kind of familiar with being watched, who are not experienced in spying or whatever it might be, won't necessarily interpret that feeling correctly because they haven't learned what the feeling means. I just hadn't known what I was feeling. Why am I stressing this? I'm stressing this because metacognitive feelings are intentional isolators. They are caused by familiarity or by knowing or by uh, being watched, but they don't by themselves enable us to draw anything, any conclusions about those things. They isolate us from the contents, the things that cause them, and we have to interpret them anew. So let me illustrate by thinking about an electric wire. There's two kinds of sensations that you might have when you encounter an electric wire. One, if you brush against it and it's live, you might get an electric shock. So here the electricity gives you a shock, but you have to interpret that shock. If you know nothing about electricity, you won't necessarily think, gosh, that's a live wire. You might think, oh, you know, I've been kind of scratched or an insect has bitten me or something like that. The sensation of electricity isn't something that tells you what it is. It's an intentional isolator. By contrast, shape perception, the sensation that you get when you look at the wire and see its beautiful rounded shape, this is a matter of visual perception and it's not something that then needs further interpretation. So you can't imagine someone saying, yep, I have that shape sensation, but I've got no idea what it's telling me, whether it's telling me about shape or some other feature of the wire. The sensation carries its cause on its face. It doesn't isolate you from its cause. So let's go back to familiarity. Here's the idea that when things are going well, when you're not being manipulated in a scientific experiment, it's the fact of familiarity that will be responsible for the fluent processing. That will give rise to a metacognitive feeling. But importantly, you have to interpret that metacognitive feeling. And you may not recognize that the feeling is one of familiarity, a feeling of being followed or a feeling of knowing. That's something that is a consequence of learning. And it's in that sense that metacognitive feelings are intentional isolators. So how does all of this help us? I want to go back to those 20 seconds, the extra looking time in the inconsistent group when they were confronted with that novel stimuli compared to the consistent group. Why did they look 20 seconds longer? What was the cause of that? My suggestion here is that it was due to a metacognitive feeling of surprise. What happened is they've got a faster process, which is keeping track of where the objects are. When an object appears to move through a solid, impenetrable barrier, 
that faster process fails, it kind of crashes. So there is disfluency, and that disfluency gives rise to a metacognitive feeling of surprise. Because that metacognitive feeling of surprise is an intentional isolator, the infant herself has got no idea at all why she is surprised. She's completely unaware of any of the physical goings on, the principles, the solidity, but nevertheless feeling surprised is now motivated to look longer. So the feeling of surprise is supposed to be due to the degree of an event's interference with ongoing mental activity. The feeling of surprise is caused by the interference that we get here and allows us to explain longer looking times in violation of expectation studies. Now you notice that in some ways this is very close to standard ways of explaining violation of expectation studies. There is a principle that infants have, let's say, you know, objects can't violate, uh, can't penetrate solid walls. Uh, that principle is violated, giving rise to some kind of feeling of surprise, which then causes the infants to look longer. The special thing about appealing to metacognitive feelings is that we are not postulating on the part of the infant any knowledge or understanding of that principle. There is some kind of faster process that one way or another, we're not saying anything about what that process represents or doesn't represent. One way or another, its ability to track the object has been interrupted. There is interference with ongoing mental activity. That's giving rise to the metacognitive feeling of surprise, and that feeling is then causing the renewed interest because the feeling itself is interested, the infant's looking longer. Just as you or I might have looked longer at that familiar seeming face that we couldn't place than we would have done at a random face. So here's the explanation that I am proposing. When we look at those early developing faster processes, the thing that connects them to the looking duration are the metacognitive feelings of surprise. And that's useful for us because it allows us to explain what's going on here without making any claims about what those faster processes are representing or not. The other thing that we needed to explain though was why it was that the early developing automatic processes are not influencing the verbal responses, the manual search and the rest of it. And the answer to that involves the idea that those metacognitive feelings are intentional isolators. I went on about that for so long because the intentional isolation means that you actually have to learn what the metacognitive feeling means. In the study that we were just looking at, you have to learn that the metacognitive feeling of surprise, feeling of magic, if you like, is due to the violation of that principle, objects are moving through solid barriers. If you're not in a position to realize, as I suppose those infants aren't, that objects can't move through solid barriers, then you're not going to have that association with the metacognitive feeling. And so you're not going to look in one place or another for the object because you've got no idea where the surprise comes from. So it's the fact that the metacognitive feelings need to be associated through a process of learning with physical violations, uh, familiarity, any other form of thing, that they cannot in infants directly influence those verbal responses or manual searches, although they can cause longer looking times. So I started this part by saying that Coriat suggests metacognitive feelings allow a transition from faster mode to slower modes of operation. I think that's right. The caveat is that that transition being offered here is quite limited. What the metacognitive feelings are providing is a kind of phenomenological signal that causes you to stop and think but they're not providing the metacognitive feelings with any kind of interpretation or understanding of what those faster processes were doing or why the faster processes were interrupted. So inspired by Coriat, the conjecture that I'm offering you is that metacognitive feelings connect those developmentally unchanging fast processes for tracking objects and minds to the slow processes. And this generates a very simple prediction. If we look at manipulations that affect metacognitive feelings of surprise in adults, for example, if I'm asking you to process a story and I give you an increasing cognitive load, although the story itself doesn't intrinsically become more or less surprising, the interruption from the story that generates in ongoing mental activity will increase, and so the metacognitive feeling of surprise will increase. So such a manipulation 
should also have task irrelevant effects on inference performance in violations of expectation task. So somewhat counterintuitively, it should be that we can generate a stronger metacognitive feeling of surprise and therefore a more pronounced difference in looking times on a violation of expectation task by some modest increase in cognitive load and decreasing cognitive load should actually make those violation of expectation task results harder to generate. Now of course this is very difficult to do with three month olds but as you've seen we can successfully do violation of expectation tasks with children who are as old as two and a half or even three. So there should be a way to test this prediction. So where am I in conclusion? My first question is why there is an interaction between, uh, with, between response types and age? Why would there be such a thing? I urged you that we should treat that as part of the data to be explained rather than a methodological quirk. And I suggested that we can answer it by appeal to the dual process theory of cognitive development. The interaction with age comes about because some responses are dominated by faster processes, others by slower processes. But that led to a second question, a question that's much more widely neglected, even by proponents of these dual process theories of cognition, who talk about, for example, core knowledge or other things like uh, Susan Carey. The question is how the fast processes could influence things like looking duration and yet not influence manual search or verbal responses. I take it that that's something which is difficult to explain. And I suggested to you that the answer to that question is that they cause metacognitive feelings. It's because they give rise to metacognitive feelings that they generate longer looking duration and because look, metacognitive feelings are intentional isolators, things that are kind of blank sensations which stand in need of interpretation, but they can't influence verbal responses or manual search unless you're already in a position to interpret those things, unless you already know them. So this is my fragmentary incomplete theory about the development of knowledge and objects and minds. Thank you very much.